morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Ashby, and uh, I'm looking after SCEP this year, directing SCEP. So welcome to SCEP 2007. Welcome to UCL. And in fact, if you are just arrived, welcome to London, and welcome to the UK. I hope you have a very enjoyable and profitable time here over the next two weeks. Phonetics is the science of speech, the study of speech. He's interested in everything to do with speech. We're interested in how speech sounds are made, how they're produced inside our mouths. We're interested in the sounds of speech, the acoustic form of speech, which we can measure very easily these days. We're interested in perception and hearing, so we need to know something about that. You probably know that phonetics makes use of a special alphabet, the International Phonetic Alphabet. There is a small picture of the whole alphabet. I'm going to show you a bigger picture. This is what the International Phonetic Alphabet looks like. It's got symbols for all of the sounds found in all of the world's languages. That's the idea. Some of them are familiar looking, some of them are very strange. So, if you're on the EFL course, you're only going to learn about a proportion of these. If you're on the IPA strand, then most of these things are going to become familiar to you over the next couple of weeks. You're going to find your way around all these wonderful sounds. The thing is that um, it looks a bit complicated, but it all fits on one page. And it's amazing that all the sounds in all the world's languages really will fit on one chart. We can do all kinds of things with these symbols. When we study phonetics in great detail, we learn, for instance, how to make and how to perceive complicated nonsense words just to train our ears. This says, uh, for example, what's the second one? Um, uh, well, again, this is more like what you'd be doing on the IPA strand. If you're interested in English, we just need a sub-selection of those symbols, a sub-part of those symbols, and we can write English. We can write English words and we can write English speech. What that says, for example, is it, it's actually a piece from a science magazine. It says a flotilla of four orbiting spacecraft has given scientists their first clear glimpse of the shock wave produced when particles pouring out of the sun, and it goes on like that. In order to transcribe English, we have to learn the meanings of a certain number of symbols. In your pack, you have twice over, I think, a list of the symbols you'll be using. One is the back page of a little green booklet called Segment Drills. And, if I'm not mistaken, you also have the list of symbols. There's a separate sheet in there. That was the intent. What does the whole sheet look like? Well, it's a page like this, which has phonetic symbols for English divided into consonants and vowels. A lot of the consonant symbols are familiar because they're ordinary letters of the alphabet. A lot of the vowel symbols are familiar, though there are certainly some new ones in there. And as you know, the idea is that for each of the distinctive sounds in English, we have a way to write it. In order to give a systematic account of the pronunciation of a language, what we need is to know what sounds does it have, exactly how are they made, and how can we represent them in a systematic way. 
every time I encounter a new language, that's what I wish somebody would give me, a list of the sounds and the symbols for them. It's such a disappointment when instead they tell you about the alphabet. <laughs> I was just in Corsica. We thought we'd try and learn some Corsican. And sure enough, I went to a bookshop and bought a book about Corsican. You open it and it says, the Corsican alphabet has so many letters. And then it starts giving you all the different meanings of the letters in different combinations. Your brain goes into a spin. What you need to know is, how many vowels has it got? Has it got five? Has it got 10? Has it got 12? That's what I want to know. How many consonants has it got? Once you know that, you understand something, you can begin to learn and listen. So this list of symbols for English should be your constant companion. That's what you're working with. And it's the same list of symbols that's used in the long and pronouncing dictionary. It's the same list of symbols effectively as the English pronouncing dictionary. <coughs> Editors of both of those dictionaries will be speaking to you over the next few days. And it's the same as the symbols in the advanced learner's dictionary, which is my dictionary. So we all agree on which symbols to use. This is wonderful. Learn the right ones, and you will be able to make use of all of those resources. If you have a look at the symbols for vowels, you'll notice that alongside each symbol there are a number of example words given. So, the first symbol is the symbol for vowel I, and the words are kit, bid, him, and minute. The words have been chosen partly to illustrate the diversity of spellings that goes with the sounds. So, for example, look at the second line where we see the vowel E, as in dress. There are three ways in which this thing is spelled. Sometimes it's spelled with letter E, which seems very sensible. Sometimes it's spelled with EA. Sometimes it's spelled with the letter A, as in many, or as in Thames, the big river that runs through this city, that's got an A right in the sound air. So this tells us that one and the same sound can be spelt in various ways. That wouldn't be too bad if each of those three ways always meant air. But of course that isn't true, because although we find, for instance, three ways of writing a as well, The writing E-A doesn't always mean E. Eh. Sometimes it means E eh, as in head, but it can also mean C, and it can also mean A, the different A as in break. So this is just a reminder, if you need one, if you need one, that you can't really hope to describe English pronunciation starting from the spelling. Lots of languages actually don't have very good spelling systems. English isn't all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you've tried to learn other languages, usually they're a bit confusing. Um, uh, there is some inconsistency. The words in the keyword list are not just arbitrary words plucked out of the air. They've been chosen for a reason partly to illustrate the diversity of spelling, and partly for this reason. The first word given for each vowel, the first word given is the name of a standard lexical set, as defined by John Wells. So kit is the established name for the vowel i. Dress is the established name for the vowel e. And those words are chosen so that even if you mispronounce them very badly and get the vowel wrong, the listener will probably know which word you mean. So suppose you can't say the vowel e, and you tend to say e. When you say keet, 
There is no word Keat that it gets mixed up with, unless you mix it up with Keats, the poet. <laughs> Keat sounds like kit. It's not going to be confused with anything else. It would be no good choosing the word hit, because when you say heat, people will say, oh, you mean heat, hot. But Keat and kit are not really confusable. The same argument goes for the other. So it's a very useful way of referring to the vowels. Further down, you see, for instance, ooh, the vowel ooh. This is called goose. Goose. Presumably because there's no goose or ghost or anything that it could get mixed up with goose. And hence you hear phoneticians talking about goose fronting. <coughs> goose fronting is something that's going on in English right now, in RP. We were just at the International Congress of Phonetic Sciences, and lots of people were talking about goose fronting, indeed delivering papers about goose fronting. So goose isn't a particularly useful word to most people, <laughs> It's not an obvious word that comes to mind, but it is a good name for this set, and it's the established name for that vowel. Um, I want to show you a page from the Advanced Learner's Dictionary. You knew it wouldn't be long before I started talking about this, which is my dictionary. Uh, here's goose. Here's goose <laughs> in the advanced learner's dictionary. And I thought you might like to hear the goose produced by the actor who recorded uh, this for me. He was considerably younger than me, so I, I think to vary, but I say something like goose, goose, goose. Listen to this speaker's goose if I can play it. Goose. 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 Considerably fronted, I think, ooh, ooh, different sort of vowel compared with mine. And as you listen around you, you'll hear different pronunciations of goose. I'm looking at various tutors whom I know to have extremely front geese. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's just part of it. English changes. We can't perpetuate English as it was. 40 or 50 years ago, or even longer than that, we have to accept its changes. And goose fronting is one of them. Now, I want to talk about something else that is the way that knowing phonetic symbols and phonetic terminology can help us understand the kind of problems that learners of English have in being understood. Many of you have English as your L2, that is the language you are striving to learn. Your L1 is something else. It's Italian or Japanese or Polish or whatever. And you will know that when people speak an L2, what tends to happen is that sounds and properties from the L1, the first language, interfere with the second one, turn up unwanted in attempts at the second language. Here's a simple example of that. And the illustration concerns the pronunciation of the name of this college. You've seen the banner UCL everywhere. UCL, UCL, UCL. There are lots of interesting things about that pronunciation, but let's think about the sounds in it, the consonants in it, for a moment. I know several Japanese learners of English who say something much more like Yushiel. <laughs> Yushiel. That's not, it isn't funny. It isn't funny. <laughs> it's not at all. Maybe it's funny when I imitate it, okay. <laughs> but the, there's nothing funny about the pronunciation. It's an entirely understandable pronunciation. Why would a speaker of Japanese tend to say Yushiel? Japanese has an S. It has a perfectly good S. There's no problem. In Japanese, you can say Sa, you can say Se. <laughs> but you can't say Si. 
Every time you want to say see, you have to say she. She, which sounds a bit like English sh. So if that little rule is transferred to English, the result is a mispronunciation, apparent mispronunciation in English. So it's a negative transfer, a simple example of a negative transfer from L1 to L2. It's not a sound that's being transferred, but a rule. The rule says, in Japanese, you can't have an S before E, you have to have a certain sound. Now, my point is, not so much that this is likely to be misunderstood, because it is actually, when you hear somebody saying you, she, you, she, el, the English listener is left thinking, oh, you shall, you shall, what is the meaning of this, I can't understand. <laughs> it's not so much the potential for misunderstanding as the simple message that, once we understand, we can do something about it. Pronunciation can be understood, and mispronunciations can be understood as well. Pronunciations can be described, mispronunciations can be understood and described, and hopefully rectified, if you know what is going on. And the really crucial thing is to appreciate that there is a way to do it. There is a whole science of phonetics, you have teachers who know about it, even if you don't know the answer straight away, then you can find out. You can find out, and there's a way to get it right. Just to go back to UCL again, did you notice I was saying it with two stresses? UCL, UCL. You might think, since it's three letters of the alphabet, we ought to say each one with the same weight and say UCL. But we don't do that. We don't say UCL, we say UCL. You see, it has only two beats in its rhythm. And which of the beats is the stronger one? Is it UCL or UCL? It's the second, UCL. The second one is a much stronger beat. We can show that too. As you see, we underline the nuclear syllable. And how do we know? How do we know that that one is stronger? It's largely the pitch. It's the pitch variation that is guiding us. Can you hear the pitch? It's going da da da, da da da. On the last syllable, the pitch goes up high and comes down again. That's what's telling us that the last syllable is strongly stressed compared with the weaker one at the beginning. Is that a peculiarity just of the name UCL? No, of course not. It's true of all abbreviations in English made up of three letters. Every time we want to speak one of these phrases, there's three letters put together, this is how we do it. So in a few days' time, you'll be hearing a lecture from someone at the BBC Pronunciation Unit. Now, how do we say BBC? BBC. We say BBC in exactly the same way as we say UCL. It has two stresses, and it's the last one, BBC, which is strongly accented. BBC. So I'm coming towards the end of my time, and this slide is headed the take home message. Now, do you know what take home is? We have this expression take home pay, which is the pay you end up with after you've paid your taxes and all the other things that are taken out of what you have earned. From this we form lots of new compounds. Take home message is the core idea you take away from a certain class. I hope you've got a, a take home message here. My take home message is that speech can be analyzed, can be measured, can be described, and it can be transcribed, we can write it. There's a whole science devoted to this, it's called phonetics, and that's what we're going to learn about. It deals with all aspects of speech, the vowels, the consonants, the stress, the pitch. Everything can be described systematically. And even interference, that is mispronunciations caused by an L1 affecting an L2, can be understood 
to some extent they can be predicted, and maybe they can be counteracted. Well, you're going to learn a lot more about these things over the next two weeks. Thank you very much.